Solomon in a minute. You want to focus our minds in prayer. Good morning, everyone. It is somewhat gloomy Sunday, but we'll take it. Right? We're alive, we're well, we're blessed. Uh, may not be the, the weather we were hoping for, but you know, sometimes it's got to rain too. You know, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. Yeah, we hope so. Like a little sunshine out there. Wouldn't be so bad either. But uh, it's good to be here with you all this morning. Uh, we're going to continue our study on uh, what is a preacher to do. Before we jump into that study, I'll have Solomon in a moment here focus our minds in prayer. The books came in that we'll do, but only some of them. Coronavirus got to rest, apparently. We're going to make some more and they'll get them shipped over here, okay? It's just, apparently it's a back order or a shortage or a shipping or something is going on that is keeping these from being able to be published and sent to us. Uh, but we do have 17 of them. So uh, that's about the number to kind of get us started. So we'll try to pass those out today after class. And we'll get everybody kind of rolling on that. Uh, and with the expectation that in about two, three the weeks. Lord knows. Uh, yeah, only the Lord knows when the rest of these books are going to show up. So. Probably on one of those trucks up in Canada. Maybe. Yeah, they might be on one of them Canadian trucks up there and they can't make their way down. Who knows? So uh, small price to pay for freedom. Uh, I've asked Solomon if he'll focus our minds in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our class. Thank you, Father. We thank you so much for having us. We pray, Father, that you will help us to understand your word, help us not only really understand, but to live out that word, that you bless us to have an opportunity to be. We thank you, Master Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we've talked over the past couple of weeks about what a preacher is to do. Uh, the importance of this is that we understand the work and the office which an evangelist holds. And from there, we understand what constraints and what liberalities they have with their, with their office as far as preaching and teaching goes. We also see some things uh, that congregations are responsible for, we've talked about. Uh, what we can bind on what we expect from the preacher's position. Uh, and understanding where the, uh, the, the evangelist as a Christian separates their duty from their duty as an evangelist. Okay. So first point was uh, a preacher must study God's word. That really kind of, if you notice, some of these are somewhat overlapping with what we must also do. Okay. But he must show uh, himself approved through his study. Uh, Paul gives young Timothy that exhortation right, to give diligence to those things, to study, to read, to act upon what is studied. Talk about a preacher must also preach the word. Seems kind of silly that you'd have to say that, but we talked about the whole word, right? The word, the whole word, and nothing but the word, right? Either you're allowed to use some other outside commentaries and things like that, but as long as we understand that the first authority comes from the scriptures. Okay. Preacher must edify the saints. Talk about building up and breaking down. Who's a builder? Who's a wrecker? And it is just as easy for a good preacher to build up a congregation as it is for a... Actually, maybe it's a little harder to build up a congregation sometimes than it is to wreck it. Mm -hmm. uh, but likewise, a, a good preacher can also be built up or torn down by those who he works with. Uh, so our responsibility is there. A preacher must convert sinners. We talked about this a little bit just on this past Thursday. Okay. Just to make sure the language is clear, and I hope my intent was clear with this, is that they preach to the conversion of the sinner. It's not up here to be a history lesson without telling people what they need to, to do to obey the gospel. There are plenty of things that a preacher can preach that have nothing to do with a person changing their lifestyle to match up with what the Bible says. To tell folks what is required of them to get into heaven. Now, history does have its importance. Those lessons are certainly important. But its primary purpose, as we see in Romans 10, is to tell folks and to preach the word and how to obey the gospel. That's the primary purpose of an evangelist, right? So I left you off in Acts 20 and verse 20 in letter C there of Roman numeral 4. In Acts 20 and 20, Paul executed four responsibilities of an evangelist. Can you list them? It's kind of one of those things where we talk about uh, elders. If a man desires, it just kind of seems that the beginning you almost don't pay attention to, but if you look at it, there's two qualifications right there. So when you're reading through Acts 20 and verse 20, when you see that, 
What is he executing in terms of his responsibilities? Well, he can't be lazy, can he? Is the preacher's responsibility to wait for somebody to knock on his door to ask him about what the gospel means? No. See how that's buried in there? But you've got to kind of uncover it a little bit. Right? We've got to look at those things. You brought up a point there. I didn't shrink to declare. What? Some of? Does he say part of? Kept back nothing. Kept back nothing. Would you look at that? Some folks uh, expect their preacher not to preach on certain topics because they don't want to ruffle too many feathers. No. No, we yeah. Or they think, well, maybe they'll offend somebody in the crowd and they'll leave and they'll never come back. Oh, man. What else you see? What he's declaring is profitable. Oh. Does profitable always mean comfortable? Ah, see? They need to step on my toes every time they get up there. Yeah. Well, they should say something that cuts to the heart, right? When we talk about good Bible preaching, good Bible preaching pricks the heart. Sometimes that's in a good way, and sometimes that's in a way that makes someone understand their current condition. And it may not always be comfortable. But it is profitable, see? Comfortable doesn't mean profitable. It's like compassion doesn't equal compromise. I may have compassion on a person for their situation, but it doesn't mean I compromise my position, right? So sometimes people conflate those words. Profitable. Well, that just means you're always building every, every, everything's a lovey-dovey sermon. What else you say? Said he... Can't be lazy. He's got to go, right? Should he also be doing it publicly? Right. He's got to be ready to speak in front of folks. Any audience. Sometimes the audience that you speak in front of may not openly receive you very well. But it doesn't forego the responsibility to still preach it. So... The whole point of that exercise, right, is that we see that there are some additional responsibilities, right? But also, dig deep into the text. Sometimes, I bet you've glanced over that passage. I bet if you've ever read Acts, and you've read this chapter, and probably you have, because Acts 20 and verse 7 is a big one for what we do on the first day of the week, right? So you've probably read through Acts 20 maybe a dozen times in your life, if you've been a Christian for any length of time. But do we, do we dig into the nuances of the scriptures, looking for what the meanings are behind those things, not just glossing over? You see that study? It's very important. If we're going to ask of this man to do something, we ought to know what we're asking and if what we're asking is scriptural. Because there may be a time where we're asking too much or he's doing too little or, or whatever the case may be. It's important to understand those things. You are, your life is an epistle, we're told. Do you know what that means? You're a, we're an open book. Yeah. What, what you do is what people read of you. You are the open letter. So how you live your life says something to them without you saying anything. Can you be a good example or a bad example without ever opening your mouth? Of course. So it's not to say that if one does not convert the sinner or bring the sinner to conversion, he is a failure. I wanted to make sure that we understand that he's only a failure. He's only failed. He never tried. That goes the same for us. Not every time when you preach the gospel is one going to obey. Okay. But just like the seed sower doesn't stop him from sowing the seed. 
Let the, let the, the seed fall on whatever soil it may. A preacher must defend the truth. I think you mentioned something about this last week. Yeah. He has a responsibility to do what there? In, in uh, letter A, a preacher must charge other that, others that they... Teach no other doctrine. Teach no other doctrine. What do you think that means? Just a brief sentence. Well, I think that example you're talking about is where Peter was not eating with those because he didn't want to offend the Sadducees yeah. or get anybody it's, upset with him. Well, it's, it's everything we've been talking about, though, over the last you know, however many minutes. Because Peter might be teaching one thing, you know, when he goes to Cornelius uh, and converts his household. He can, it's one thing for him to say, you know, God has shown me that no person is unclean, and, you know, he baptizes Cornelius' household. But what does the epistle of Peter's life say in this moment in Galatians 2 when he's holding himself aloof from other Gentiles? Or like, how are the other Gentiles reading him? How are the other Jews reading him? Uh, and Paul calls him out for not, for being, uh, the, the wording is being out of step with the gospel. That's what Paul says in Galatians 2. So he was talking the talk, but he wasn't walking the walk. They're clean. There's nothing wrong with them. They're now part. They're just, they received the, the gift of the Holy Ghost just as we did in the beginning. But then he refuses to go eat a, with them out of embarrassment or not wanting to, to upset people. I mean, we were, just like we read last week with the, with the verse where we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged by his word, right? How lives out his word, right? And uh, if you look at Paul's ministry, he, he reasoned through Scripture. That's why it's so important to know that. Because we don't want to dishonor Jesus in, in, in our actions and in the Lord's way. Um, often my prayer is, Lord, don't ever take, I pray that I never take one of your words out of context. My only goal is to bring someone to have a relationship with you. Right? And because I'm human, right? And I'm not, not as educated as I need to be, but God has the intent of my heart, which is to bring people to have a relationship with him. And that should be your key goal. Yeah. It's all of our key goals. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. Who was able to fill in the blanks there? Also, so the word there used, defense, to always give a defense, right? Which is what we're talking about, defending the truth. The word is apologia, 
we take that word as an apology, right? That, that's where that word comes from. We, we would recognize that word almost immediately, right? But when we use it today, when I issue you an apology, does that mean what this means? Is that the same context? I'm so sorry, I believe in Jesus. Forgive me. Let me go. Is that what, is that, what that word means? And the, where it ended up that way is, you know, to apologize is to explain yourself, right? And so if you've done something wrong, you know, somebody might tell you, or explain yourself. You need and to it apologize. might end up with you asking forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's how it's ended up being apologized in that sense today. But in the biblical sense, it is that matter of, or that meaning of giving an explanation for a reasoned, A reasoned statement or an argument. There's another word we now today has a negative connotation. An argument is just a debate. It's not that word does not by itself have a negative connotation. We think two people are arguing, they're kind of yelling at each other, they're fighting back and forth. That's not what the word argument means. It's kind of like almost a debate. You have a reason statement. Here's this, here's this, and here's why, right? So we should always be ready to give a defense. Not to apologize for loving Christ, not to apologize in the sense that we might use that word today, but to be able to give a defense for why. A reasoned defense. And I encourage folks to do this in a similar exercise to what John was talking about, is because the folks that are teaching your children have a very reasoned defense for what they're teaching. Not that it's reasonable or that it makes sense, but believe me, their statements for what they believe are laid out quite clearly. And unfortunately, they are doing a much better job today than some of us are doing. Remember, they get a long time with your kids. They see them five days a week. You got them for an hour in there. You might get them in that science class and they start teaching about something like evolution. You think they have a very reasoned, very well thought out statement? It doesn't mean it's the truth, right? That's not what I'm saying. Because a person can have a really good explanation, a really well thought out statement, doesn't mean there's truth. That's not the point. For us, could you give a defense? A well thought out reasoned argument or statement for why you believe what you believe. Well, that's the preacher's job. That's part of what they have to do. They must earnestly contend for the faith. You know what a contender is, right? Most of us know that word. Right? It's a, it's like a, it's an active sport, isn't it? We're at war. Our adversary is very cunning. And truth be told, he knows the scriptures better than we do. Knows them all front to back, backwards and forwards. And he uses those things. Twist them just a little bit. You saw he did that when he tempted Jesus, didn't he? he just twisted it just a little bit. Before it is written, right? He's not going to let his son get dashed upon the rock, right? He's not, not going to let that happen to him. Remember that? He's going to have a good reasoned argument, isn't he? What do you think that means to contend for the faith? Jude 3. What else do you think? Contending for the faith. Yeah, for the faith. Does that mean we're combative? Can you disagree without being disagreeable? Contend without being contentious. Yeah, contend without being contentious. Disagree without being disagreeable. Right? You see, that goes back to that give a defense. It's a reason. If you're all in your feels, as they might say today, if your emotions are running high and you're maybe lashing out a little bit, are you reasoned? No, it's reasoned. 
Yeah, the very first imperative that Jude gives in that letter is in verse 17. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing he calls them to do, besides saying, I, I wrote for you, I uh, found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. The first thing he tells them to do, consistent with that, is root themselves in the words of the apostles of Jesus Christ. You must remember. Sometimes, and I'll admit this, I, especially when I was younger, I was on fire. Okay, just recently became a Christian. I was, you know, you've probably been there. You were blazing. You know what I mean. You were ready. You know, and then you heard somebody. They said something, and man, you were ready to just jump up, just jump right on it. And then they say something back, and then you, and it's kind of like I don't know if you ever had like a little brother or a little sister. You get one little tap, and then the next one's harder, and then it's harder, and then before you know it, it's a knockdown, dragout brawl. I've had that happen. Not to the knockdown, dragout brawl situation, but where emotions ran too high, right? And I was no longer giving a reasoned defense. Okay? Because now I was far too emotionally involved in the situation. Now, if somebody's emotional and you're yelling and I'm yelling and we're doing our thing, is anybody really listening? Not really. Sometimes that's hard for an evangelist to do where they get up and week after week after week they're preaching the same things and you don't see it happening and it's easy for an evangelist when they get up there to get emotional about that I keep telling you why don't you listen that's what he wants to say how many times do I have to tell you right? you've been with me this whole time you ain't learned anything what's the matter with you people you know but he, in his position, Caleb or an evangelist of any, it's okay for emotions to run, right? To be passionate about the way that they're preaching. But not to get unreasonable, to give a steady defense for those things. And to continue to preach on. A preacher must set an example. Did you raise your hand? means to wage war. It literally means to wage war. But what's the object? We are now contending for the faith. It's a spiritual warfare. In the Ephesian letter, Paul talks about put on the whole armor. And what's the first piece of equipment? A soldier puts on helmet. The helmet of what? Is it truth? Absolutely. I'm trying to think back to the passage so I don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to prepare for the battle. You put on that helmet of truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The shield of faith. You see, so it's, a, it, it's prepared to wage war against error. Contend for it. Fight for it. Spiritually. We've got to be ready to, you know, when Christ says you, you deny yourself and you take up your cross and you follow after me. Or when the scriptures tell us, as Keats alluded to, to prepare for war. You're going into battle. It's, it's not going to be easy. Which verse are you talking about? The verse that we're just going to talk about in Jude. Jude 3? Yeah. I just, I 
found it necessary to write to you appealing to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Yeah. So is he talking about the, within the body making sure that the word is true and straight and being taught and represented the right way within the church? Because if we were um, <clears throat> not all with the same message and we gave different messages to different people, it would get watered down. So the way that I read that is that he's talking talk, talk about the body being of one mind and, and contending to the faith to make sure that we, we have it correct. So when we go out and share the gospel to other people, we're, this guy's not saying this, this guy's not saying this, this guy's not saying that, right? And that's one of the things that some people struggle with. The church as a whole, there's over 60,000 denominations of the Christian faith. You know what I mean? And, and so what they're trying to do here, what I understand this verse, is they're trying to make sure that the body is all on the same page so we can contend for the faith. Is, is that correct? So it's one of those questions where if you asked it like this, are you to contend for the faith inside the house, God uh, in the body, and outside of the body? This is one of those where you say, yes. Which one is it? Is it this one or that one? Yes. Yes. It's both. We are to contend for the faith in all situations. Whether we're in here or we are out there. In fact, out there is really our, is really our war zone. Yeah, we are, we still battle in here, right? We're battling for unity, we're battling for truth, we're battling to convert, we're battling to do this, we're battling to do that, right? It's inside and outside. So, a Christian has a, so, and, and here's what, how I want you to kind of understand that if I can. Your responsibility is as a Christian, and for the evangelist himself to contend for the faith, doesn't stop when you walk out the door on Sunday. In fact, that's when you should really be checking your gear, right? Am I really up to snuff when you walk outside? Of course, we should always be diligent and be on alert. It tells us to be sober-minded, right, to do those things. So, yes, absolutely, I think it's both. So, in 1 Timothy 4, 12-14... Let no one despise... I love this verse, by the way. Okay. For now, anyway, because I guess I'm still what I might consider young. All right? <laughs> you know, especially when I first got into evangelizing. So he says here, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Do not neglect. You see how many, how many things? Well, you could get a whole. You could get five sermons out of this, you know, if you wanted to. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Man, you could just don't waste your gifts. Right? Be a good example. Do all of these things. There's a lot of meat in those in those verses, isn't it? A preacher must set an example. How does he set an example? Humble and also in his conduct. Mm -hmm. In his attitude and in how he conducts himself. Does that mean he has to be perfect? A lot of people want that. There's a lot of pressure... And I can speak from experience on a preacher to keep up appearances. Mm -hmm. Nothing's wrong. I'm okay. My faith is fine. I stand perfect. And I don't mean perfect as in without error, but I stand perfect as in I am complete. I lack nothing. Like, you know, he has every verse in the Bible memorized, book, chapter, and verse. You know, that, that's kind of the expectation sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, you certainly feel that way. I can tell you from, from experience you do. My kids have to be perfect. My wife has to be perfect. My life has to be perfect. It's an example of where sometimes we want to hold the minister up to the, uh, the standards of the elders. Because Paul says an elder does have to be above reproach. Mm -hmm. And he does bring in the wife and the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you know, and, and again, even then we should acknowledge there's a difference between being above reproach and uh, uh, being without sin. Or praise, but it, yeah, being putting on a good front. Uh, and you, you had said what we were talking about a minute ago. Uh, but we should recognize that that set of standards is for the eldership. <laughs> some people set some pretty high standards. Yeah. I also wanted to say another way that some folk have made a mistake is when the church is revolving around the preacher and not Christ, like around his personality. Okay. Amen. Sometimes he gets put on a little bit higher just because he preaches from up high doesn't mean that's where we put him, right? Yeah. Yeah, he might, might be elevated as far as that goes, but as people, we don't do that. He is, like us, a man who is a fellow worker, a laborer, a contender for the faith, same as we are. The bottom line is I'm not here for him. I'm here for Christ. Yeah. As much as I like his preaching. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked the question, are all... Oh, go ahead. Here for a lot of things. Here for yourself too, by the way. Don't ever, you know, don't. You can't pour from an empty cup. Are you here also for yourself? Whose salvation are you trying to work out right now? With fear and trembling. So, are all examples good examples? Hmm? Can you set a bad example? Can an evangelist set a bad example? So does he have to be, because of the platform in which he is given, is he under a little bit more pressure, as we talked about in the previous weeks, right? A teacher will be held to a higher standard, not by us, but by the Lord. Is he under just a little bit extra pressure to make sure that he's trying to do his very best to be a good example? Yes. That is true. Okay, But that needs to come from within him, not us setting some lofty expectation that when he gets up, you know, the bright light's going to come from behind his head and, oh, you know, angels are coming down while he's talking. Okay? But he needs to make sure he's setting a good example. And a preacher must do his best to keep a good attitude while he does it. It will reflect in his work. How, how could that be? Hey, come here, preacher. I, you said that one thing. I, I just want to tell you. I was over here. I was just nitpicking every little thing that you said, by the way. Yeah. You know, when I usually begin things when I do it, I say, listen, I put a little something in there for everybody. For you folks that like to find mistakes, I put a little something in there for you, too. You know? Can he have a bad attitude? Can he have a good attitude? Some of that is us. Some of that is him. But how could a bad or a good attitude reflect in his work? You don't get to answer that. I haven't seen that. Do you think if he has a negative attitude towards the folks that he's working with, that he's going to do his very best work? No. Think about the times when you were at work, and maybe even you were younger or whatever it was, and you know, your, your fellow co-workers got you upset or you got screamed at by that customer or whatever it was. Were you doing your best work? Right? Probably not. Probably not. Maybe by having that bad attitude in the contentious crowd or somebody nitpicking or doing whatever that is, do you think that that may weigh on his mind a little heavier than getting the study done? Absolutely. You think it might be hard not to We'll say preach emotionally. Yeah. But the same as a good attitude will also reflect in his work. When he's being supported for and provided for the way a congregation ought to support and provide for their evangelists, right? We aren't given, and that's not like a, we get to choose if we do that kind of thing. We're commanded to do that. Okay? We're commanded to take care of him. We take care of all those who want to preach or contend for the faith. That's our job. 
do good unto all men, especially those of the household faith. You're probably familiar with that verse. But he'll do his best work when he has a good attitude. Now, just like I tell Jenny, who's in control? So it's, he also has the responsibility to do his very best to maintain a good attitude, even in adverse conditions. Right. Not every day is going to be your best day. tell you that doesn't always that doesn't always mean anything sometimes those little groups can be the rough ones uh you know i've seen them ragtag groups uh, but i understand your point i understand your point uh, i want us to reflect so we understand that it's his responsibility to do so i want us to also before we close this down reflect on yourself how's my attitude been this week when the uh when the road is rough, when I, when I had my trial or my tribulation over the past whatever length of time, how was my attitude? How did I respond to that? You were probably depressed. Well, uh, we talked in the book of Proverbs about wisdom. And that is where your wisdom will come into play, is to understand that it, he when the scriptures say that we suffer no thing that is not common to our brethren or common to man, you might have a different circumstance, but you're not the first person to go through it. And you're not going to be the only person to go through it. You're not the first person to have a bad day, and you won't be the only person. And by the way, this won't be your only bad day. Okay? But the scriptures tell us to take something from that. You can learn as much in a tribulation sometimes, if not more, than you can in times of abundance. Right? You can learn. If you want to figure out the character of a person, put them in a, like an adverse condition, and then we'll see what their character really is. Okay? So you have an opportunity to show the Lord in these types of circumstances, Lord, even in times of adversity, I love you. Even in times of adversity, I will follow your commandments. And I won't use it as an excuse to lash out or to shirk my responsibilities. You know, there's going to come a time where every one of us is going to have to show by the way we conduct ourselves and the way that we talk how much we really want to be in heaven. He knows. It's no different for the evangelist than it is for us. Same for me. And believe me, I'm up here teaching, preaching to myself as much as I am to anybody else. We're going to have to show those things. So he has to keep a, a good attitude. It's going to reflect in his work. So if you start to see a bad attitude in your preacher, start to see bad work, it's usually a red flag. Check in on him. See how he's doing. So that's the end of this class. We'll... Pick up on our, our, the rest of our Roman numerals and try to get through the rest of the study on Thursday, Lord willing, if you're able to make it. And then we'll start back up in our book. Don't forget to grab one on your way out today if you really want one. Uh, I would just encourage, if you could share, maybe if you sit next to somebody, share a book. Make sure we've got enough for all the folks who need them. And of course, before the class comes to a close, as I try to do always, if I remember, if you need to make something right in your life, don't wait until after services or the invitation or whatever comes. Make that known now. And if you need to obey the gospel or do anything else, we're ready to help you, even if it's not, after the sermon. Okay. So thanks for your good time and your good study.